Good afternoon, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you in this full room this year. Uh, my name's Kumi Taguchi. It's such a pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of Australia for UNHCR to celebrate World Refugee Day. I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. To those of you joining us online, welcome. I, ex I also extend uh, my, that respect to the traditional owners of the land that you're joining us on from today. Now, World Refugee Day is marked on the 20th of June. It's about the strength, resilience and courage of men, women and children who are forced to flee their homes as a result of war, persecution and conflict. It's also a celebration of refugee achievement and contribution. This year, the global theme is every person has the right to see safety, whoever they are, wherever they come from, and whenever they are forced to flee. This is my seventh year hosting this event. It's just so wonderful to see so many familiar faces. I know for a lot of us, this is like the one time of the year we get to really hang out together. And um, I know this is where it becomes difficult for me to wrangle you all in the room because you want to catch up on 12 months of news. So I will be cracking down. Um, we have almost 400 of you in this room today and also a lot of you joining us online. It's a hybrid event. It's so wonderful to have you joining us from all around Australia. We're thinking of you joining us online. Thank you so much. For being in the room here with us. I would like to welcome some very special guests here today. Adrian Edwards, UNHCR Regional Representative for Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific, he's based in Canberra, and the Chair of Australia for UNHCR's board, Michael Dwyer, as well as board members Kate Dundas, Lynn Dang and Rick Millen. Consul General of Japan, based in Sydney, Mr Kia Masahiko, the teams from SSI, Thrive Enterprise, Bread and Butter Project and UNICEF, it's such a wonderful privilege to have you joining us again this year. We are going to be hearing from some really inspiring people today, including 2020 New South Wales Australian of the Year Professor Munjed Almadiris. We're also going to be meeting the winner of the inaugural Les Murray Award for Refugee Recognition. This is sponsored by SBS. Uh, Daniel Malbasa is a most worthy recipient of the award. He's travelled from Melbourne to be with us today. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, we're also delighted to have Les Murray's daughters, Tanya and Natalie, in the room with us as well, as well as other members of the Murray family, uh, Andrew, Kathy, Maria and Joseph. Thank you so much for being here. I'd also like to welcome Australia for UNHCR's special representatives and ambassadors, Ian Chappell, Aminata Kontebaiga, Karina Hong and Raja Yassin. And welcome to our leading women fund ambassadors, Janine Ellis and Zoe Ghani. Welcome too to Michael Baldwin, the chair of the Business Leaders Engagement Committee and other committee members. So much of this event, as you would know, would absolutely not be possible without our wonderful sponsors. We are so grateful to our presenting sponsor, First Sentia Investors, for the support it has provided over so many years. This World Refugee Day marks the 16th year of First Sentia's incredible commitment. We are so pleased that CEO Mark Steinberg and Managing Director Australia and New Zealand Liz Hastelow have joined us and we'll hear from Mark after our lunch. Thank you so much to our silver sponsors, Teachers Health, who are also long-term supporters of Australia for UNHCR. I'm so pleased that Teachers Health CEO Brad Joyce is able to join us here today. Thank you too to our other silver sponsor, TAL, CEO Brett Clark and Chief Commercial Officer Andrew Howard, thank you so much. TAL has been a long-term supporter of World Refugee Day. Thank you so much for coming on board this year as a silver sponsor. Half of the tables in this room have been purchased by corporates. Thank you to the corporate se sector for in, um, supporting the work of UNHCR globally. And thank you too to the many individual supporters joining us today and also those who are supporting Australia for UNHCR on a very regular basis. I also want to thank all the generous companies that have donated gifts for today's raffle. It's an awesome raffle. It's really fun. You're going to have a lot of fun. As you can see on screen, there are a lot of um, items up for um, the raffle. Maybe you can't see it on screen, but there's also little notifications on your table. So have a look at those. Over the past 12 months, Australia for UNHCR has had one of its most challenging year. Firstly, we saw that Taliban takeover of Afghanistan and then the war in Ukraine. 
Today we're going to be raising money for protection activities around Ukraine, including funding the so-called Blue Hubs, which UNHCR together with our sister agency UNICEF operate. Now these hubs provide a safe space and services to especially vulnerable people, including women, young families and unaccompanied children. We'll be hearing more about UNHCR's protection work for refugees and displaced people in Ukraine from National Director Naomi Steer and the programs that we hope to fund with your support today. We all know why we're in this room. Being my seventh year, I have no qualms about trying to get us up to the target that we set today. So we have currently raised, let's have a look, um, $163,000 for World Refugee Day. Our goal is to raise $250,000. You can see that target on your screen. You can also see we have gold and silver dots. These represent the generous support of First Centia Teachers Health and Tell. So whether you're in the room or joining us online, we've got a number of ways for you to help us reach that goal today. You can make a donation and you can also buy raffle tickets and or. So each donation of $500 or more is going to be acknowledged with a blue dot on the screen alongside our sponsors. So you will see a blue dot come up if you donate $500 or more. Basically what you do is you can go to your little program, there's a QR code, that will send you to an, a platform where you can donate a bunch of money and you can also um, buy raffle tickets through that same platform, so it's all really easy. The raffle tickets, for the first time our online audience is also able to buy them because of this QR code. You can buy one, five or 10 at a time. I've done the maths. It's much more financially efficient to buy 10. <laughs> So just buy 10. The prizes are fabulous. There's two nights stay at Paperbark Camp in Jervis Bay. There's a pamper pack from Nature's Energy, tickets to the show at the Sydney Theatre Company. So um, you can basically use that QR code. And what will happen is you'll receive a text saying, hey, these are your winning raffle ticket numbers, and we'll draw those towards the end of the lunch. Now, if you're wanting to make a larger donation of $5,000 or $10,000, we would be so happy to accept a pledge. If you could let Deborah, Trudy or Viren know if you'd like to make a pledge today, I might just get um, those three to stand up just so you know where they are in the room in case you want to make a pledge to them. Um, and you can just approach, there's Trudy, thank you Trudy, you can approach them over the course of the lunch. Okay, that's the longest speech for me today, so you can all breathe a sigh of relief. I'll update you over the next two hours about how we're going with that fundraising target. We'll be able to see it live, so it'll be really exciting, and we can all get excited about reaching that target. But right now, it's my very, very great pleasure to welcome to the stage Adrian Edwards, UNHCR Regional Representative for Australia, New Zealand, and the Pacific. Thank you, Kumi, uh, for that. And how great uh, to be uh, here with you all. And I, uh, like others before, like Kumi before me, begin today by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. And I pay my respects too to the elders, past and present. And I extend that to Aboriginal and any Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. So it's been 36 years. Uh, since the first Refugee Week here in Sydney, uh, if my math is correct, and, over just, uh, 20, uh, and just over 21 years since the UN's General Assembly declared 20th of June as World Refugee Day. And uh, while we're on dates, just allow me to say too that it's a little over 70 years since uh, UNHCR was created, and for any of you truly into refugee history, it's also 2021 was 100 years uh, since a Norwegian polymath, uh, he was also an explorer, a diplomat, and a legendary cross-country skier, um, Fritjof Nansen. It's 100 years since he became the, f the world's first high commissioner for refugees. This, of course, was under the League of Nations becoming High Commission, that is, not the cross-country skiing. Colleagues and friends, uh, I'm delighted to be with you here today. Uh, we are celebrating this occasion hand in hand with people who have lived the refugee experience. And to take with you a much needed moment to honor refugees and their remarkable individual stories. Because today, and for refugees and other displaced people, as well as the communities uh, that shelter them, the hand of help truly matters more than ever. It's this 
that makes the work that Australia for UNHCR does so crucial. And may I say, it's not just here in Australia, but now also in New Zealand too, where as of this year, uh, we now also have a fundraising entity, New Zealand for UNHCR. For this, my thanks to Australia for UNHCR and to the government and people of New Zealand. And together, we're gonna to look forward to building understanding of UNHCR's work with refugees. Now, I've seen a few faces uh, today uh, already, and it's a little hard standing here to see you all, but it's, uh, I saw many faces, people who were here a year ago. Um, now, that can seem quite a while back, as a great deal has happened since. Here in Australia, uh, we all spent, as you know, many months in lockdown with borders closed. Uh, beyond our shores, we saw the crisis in Myanmar, as you heard from Kumi, uh, the, the heart-rending scenes you'll all remember at Kabul airport last August, and many hundreds of Afghans being evacuated to Australia, to New Zealand, and to other countries. Um, also, tens of thousands of others who have applied to be able to come here. We also watched, and I just pick a few things from the last year, the Djokovic saga playing out, briefly shining a light onto really what was the what has been the truly Kafkaesque world of refugee detention, and then Ukraine, which we hear about today. Amid this all, and very much more too, uh, was Australia's recent election campaign, and of course, a change of government. But today, I'd like to speak uh, to the situation beyond Australia's shores. For those of us working to help refugees, we often tend to talk in terms of protection uh, and of solutions. Here in Australia, our focus is often on the solution side of the equation. Uh, that means settlement, that means integration, restoring rights, building and creating connections between refugees and us, our communities. This is the part of the, equa the equation that has to do with what happens after the crisis, how we help here. And for a world that produces refugees and for how we live, this work is utterly crucial. What we do right in Australia, as well as what we get wrong, sends important messages to the world beyond our shores. And for any of you who may have been following developments this past week in the UK with attempts there to send refugees to Rwanda, um, you will know that there are resonances with what happens elsewhere. But in many other regions, and particularly for those places where crisis or conflict is happening, or into which people are fleeing, it's protection that is often the first and dominant focus. These can be difficult and dangerous places. They are the ones that most typically are in the news. And I ask you to spare a thought today for the refugees and displaced people in these places, and also for my colleagues, for other aid workers, the journalists and others who put their lives on the line so that they can help and keep these situations from being forgotten. Stay and deliver is not just a slogan, it's what UNHCR does, it's what our partners do, and it's what the various human rights defenders around us do as well. Uh, today, at this hour, right now, uh, every hour, uh, every day of the year. In the case of UNHCR, this genuinely couldn't happen without the support you give to refugees through Australia for UNHCR. It is the selfless act of individuals, many of yourselves, that is making this possible. I briefly mentioned Afghanistan a few moments ago, um, but today, and as we're here in the Asia-Pacific region and part of that, we shouldn't forget Myanmar too and the coup that happened barely 16 months ago. There the situation has become genuinely calamitous, now with a million people displaced and which many are looking at as being Asia's version of the war in Syria. But in truth, there are many crises and conflicts today there are too many to do justice uh, to those they affect. I've mentioned Afghanistan, Myanmar, Ukraine. You'll all know of many others. Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, Congo, South Sudan, the Sahel, Venezuela. There's plenty more. As a colleague of mine recently observed, the past 12 months should be a stark reminder to us all of why the drafters of the United Nations Charter chose for the document's very first sentence uh, uh, they showed in that their determination to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. This document, with its aim to maintain international peace and security, has really seldom seemed as relevant and needed 
as it is today and in 2022. It was also born out of conflict and bloodshed. And let me say that its, that its drafters were far from naive. They knew that alone a UN charter was hardly likely to achieve peace and security. Instead, what they were drafting was designed as a blueprint for collective action. As President Roosevelt noted at the Yalta Conference of 1945, and that was a key milestone in the development uh, uh, of the UN Charter, peace can only endure so long as humanity really insists upon it and is willing to work for it and sacrifice it, sacrifice for it. And how right he was. This year, for the first time, we have crossed a historic milestone of seeing more than 100 million people forcibly displaced globally. 2022 has brought us to a moment that is unprecedented so far in the 21st century, and probably before that. It's a moment in which the need for collective action and countries and peoples working together, overcoming differences, has rarely mattered more. 100 million people stand for 100 million reasons to overcome differences and to help. My friends, everyone has the right to seek safety, as you just heard from Kumi, whoever they are, wherever they come from, and whenever they are forced to flee. Indeed, this is Article 14 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, drafted back in 1948, and which has saved countless lives since. Some would challenge this notion today, and believe me, it would be a more difficult and contentious world were they to succeed. This coming Monday is World Refugee Day, a day to honor the courage, strength, and contributions of the millions of people around the world who have been forced to flee their homes due to violence, war, or persecution. It's a day to remember that with help from welcoming communities and neighbors, people can rebuild their lives, their networks, start afresh, and thrive. It's also a day when, around the world, we ask people to remember the importance of welcoming newcomers into their communities. Those who've been forced to flee bring with them their cultures, their unique experiences, their hopes, all of which makes any community stronger and more vibrant. And I think here in Australia, we speak with strong experience to this very spirit. By being here today, you are standing with refugees. Your support, the actions you take, your successes, your voices in speaking out, the innovation and ideas you help foster, and the compassion you show, these profoundly matter on behalf of UNHCR and the 100 million people whose plight we all work for. I thank you, and I thank Australia for UNHCR. What exactly are blue dots? Today, I'm in Chisinau, Moldova. I would like to introduce you to blue dots. Blue dots are safe spaces where refugees fleeing from Ukraine can access information and practical support. UNHCR, together with UNICEF, is setting up the spaces to provide specialist help to the refugees that need extra care, like children traveling on their own, women with young children, persons with disabilities, and survivors of sexual violence. Where does UNHCR set up Blue Dots? Blue Dots are set up in the places where refugees arrive, like border crossings, transport hubs, in the cash enrollment centers. What services does UNHCR offer at Blue Dots? At Blue Dots, children traveling on their own can be reunited with their family. Parents can have access to the group parenting activities and get immediate psychological help. Also, there are places for children to play, places to rest, safe spaces for breastfeeding, access to clean water and Wi-Fi. At Blue Dots, vulnerable refugees can access help and advice tailored to their most immediate needs. Thank you so much, Adrian, for your speech and for being here today. And I'd like to introduce and welcome to the stage a woman you all know so well, the National Director of Australia for UNHCR, Naomi Steer.
Thank you, Kumi. And I've just done the, the thing any um, speaker shouldn't do is dig into the salad. Uh, and I didn't have a chance to say to my husband, is there any green in my teeth? Um, so, so please let me know. As I stand here, I, and I keep smiling, that's the problem, if I was more serious. At the outset, I too want to acknowledge the Gadiel people of the Eora Nation on whose lands we are meeting today and honour their leaders past, present and emerging. I want to welcome everybody here today. Uh, as Adrian has said, you know, so many familiar faces, not just from last year, but for, for many years now. And I could happily sit at every table here as I see friends around the room and would love to. There is never enough time to, to talk and chat, but I really thank you all for, for coming and returning um, every year as you do to support Australia for you and HCR and refugees. This is particularly so, as some of you might know, that this year marks my 22 years as National Director of Australia for UNHCR. And also, and it might be a shock to some of you, but it will be my last year in that role, as I hand over the leadership to the very capable hands of Trudy Mitchell as the next CEO. And Trudy is here. Um, Trudy, I'll make you stand up. <laughs> And Trudy is an absolute powerhouse, and behind every great um, noisy national director, there is a fantastic deputy. And you know, I'm very pleased and proud that that Trudy will be stepping into the role. I take my leave in what continues to be a year of incredible highs and lows. Highs because of the ongoing generosity of countless Australians and organisations supporting refugees and displaced people but lows because of the escalation of conflict resulting in the massive global displacement, which Adrian has referred to, of 100 million people worldwide. An incredible and, and stark and startling figure. While global political will and leadership is required to end the multiple conflicts driving displacement, we all have a role to play in helping meet the humanitarian needs of people caught up in crises beyond their control, and in doing so, also help create a better and safer world for all of us. Today we are asking you to support our UNHCR operations for the Ukraine emergency. Thank you to the many organisations and donors here today who have already supported our appeal, raising a massive $13 million to date, um, just from Australia and Australians. However, the need is enormous. Uh, UNHCR has advised that the sort of current needs are only 62% funded. And of course, the crisis, ongo crisis sadly is ongoing and, and apparently seeming to, to get larger. At this lunch, as Kumi has said, we're raising funds for UNHCR's protection activities, which have at its heart the so-called blue dot hubs. You will have seen the images and reality of refugee ex exodus from Ukraine, counting many millions of women and children as men stay behind to defend their country. Children are especially vulnerable and at risk to sexual exploitation, violence and trafficking. Jointly established with uh, our sister agency UNICEF, together with local authorities and partners, the Blue Dot Hubs are safe spaces dotted along border crossings from Ukraine into neighbouring countries like Poland, Moldova, Romania and Belarus. And they provide families and children with critical information and services. Um, and we've seen some of those in the video. Emergency items, blankets, clothes, personal hygiene items a safe space and friendly space for children to play, family reunification services, counselling and psychosocial support for children and parents or caregivers suffering trauma and anxiety from living through the war. Today we're hoping to fund one dot hub, if not more, uh, providing a safe space for women and children and other vulnerable people caught up in the conflict in Ukraine. Now, hands up, who has had a go at doing it um, online? Okay, that's a few of you. There's a bit more to go. I was just speaking before to... Um, to one of our long-standing uh, supporters, Lorraine Berenz, who came up to me and said, look, it was first really difficult, but it's actually really easy. So I said, okay, I'm gonna quote you on that. We had a debate. 
you know, back at, back at the office, do we really want to do this? And we decided we did. So uh, please um, uh, support our courage of conviction that we can all manage a bit of technology. My children are here. I've brought them all so they can assist Peter, my husband, uh, personally, you know, um, I know. But please ask the many volunteers um, around the room, where are our volunteers? Hands up can't see anybody. <laughs> no, they're, they're all at the back. You could come forward. They're, they're the fantastic team and staff in the white t-shirts if you do have any problem because we do want to raise those funds and uh, it would be a fantastic outcome to, to have achieved funding for at least one um, Blue Dot Hub today. I wanted to take a few moments just to talk about two key things and kind of reflections after 22 years, um, but there will be other opportunities for that um, and, and hopefully more time. But some of you might remember World Refugee Day was first marked back um, in 2001 by UNHCR with a fantastic campaign featuring prominent refugees around the world, including Madeleine Albright, supermodel Alex Weck and Isabella Lundé, and our own Nobel Prize winner and eminent scientist and immunologist Sir Gustav Nossel. And uh, that was that required all of them, including Sir Gustav, to lip sync and dance to Aretha Franklin's R E S P E C T. And it was an amazing campaign and also a sign of the times. And, and it was, I, I remember actually dealing with Sir Gustav's um, EA, who was quite fearsome, and telling me, Sir Gustav does not sing, Sir Gustav does not dance. But we went down with a film crew and 17 takes later, he was amazing. <laughs> he, he had it down. And it's such an important thing, respect. We're sort of almost at that stage in Australia and globally, you know, we're just looking to, to keep people alive, let alone respect, but we must never forget the importance of that and what it means. For me, it's about valuing and recognising the hardships refugees have endured and the resilience they have shown in rebuilding often shattered lives. Today is a timely opportunity to not only stand up for refugees and their rights, but also acknowledge the immense contribution they make to this country. And we're not a, I normally can't make political statements, and I won't, but it is nearly at the end of 22 years, so sorry, Adrian, watch out. This is the period where, you know, your, your colleague goes mad. <laughs> But I do really hope that the recent election does signal a new, new time, a new policy, a more humane policy that we can all be proud of uh, around refugee and asylum policy in this country. In this room right now, there are... Yeah, thank you. In this room right now, there are many extraordinary people who've overcome huge challenges, not just the sort of things that, you know, most of us face in our lives from time to time, relationship breakups, job losses, personal disappointments, but life-threatening challenges, getting on leaky boats and wondering whether you're going to drown, fleeing possible torture or execution. They've not only survived, but many have gone on to excel in their fields and contribute to Australia in many ways. Again, right in this room, just looking at the people I know, our ambassadors, Karina Huang, an author, publisher, academic, actor in the Heights. I remember when she rang up and said, oh, I've received this audition notice for sort of Vietnamese actors for this new ABC production. I thought I might go. I said, have you any acting experience? No. But you know, when you've spent six months on an island thinking you're going to die in your rescue, there is nothing that you will not do again in your life. And that's what refugees bring to us. Uh, and, and thank you, Karina, for, for everything you do for Australia for you and HCR. There are people like, like Aminata Conte Berger, and Aminata is here. You know, again, an amazing woman who now runs her own foundation. She was one of our very early spokespeople, speaking and bravely about her own experience. Also an acclaimed actress, um, and she recently was honoured by speaking at the Australian Press Club. My board members, Lynn Dang, Head of People and Culture for Microsoft in Singapore, whose family fled Singapore, uh, uh, um, Vietnam on, on, on a boat. Sahida Ghani, 
tech nerd, you won't mind me saying that. She describes herself as a closet poet, but now she's an author with her book, Pomegranate and Fig, launched this week to wide acclaim. Um, and I really urge you all to go out and, and, and buy it. And our special guest speaker, Dr. Medeiros, a leading orthopedic surgeon, um, Thank you, there we are. Thank you for, for coming and we're going to hear about that. Who, after bravely arriving on a boat, was put in detention for 10, ten months. Um, and can you imagine what that would mean uh, to any of us? And I'm just saying as professionals and when you have to start absolutely again, but what people have achieved. And of course, our wonderful nominees for the Les Murray Award. Um, on your table is this beautiful book of these stories. Um, and at the table here, I have some of the nominees and they're, they're all amazing. But I did want to welcome um, Daniel. Um, where are you, Daniel? There, who's a lawyer and advocate for refugees. And really, look, it's a beautiful book and we're very proud of, 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 of the award. Their courage and resilience is also reflected in the many thousands of refugees in our community and the millions of displaced people globally. The private sector, which is pretty much all of us here, has an important role to play, not only in providing funding, but also tapping into the skills and experience of many of those of displaced. I know companies like SSI, I think you're up there, SSI. Give me a shout out if you're there. Yay, thank you. <laughs> Talent Beyond Borders, Career Seekers and Thrive, I know, Thrive. And also Cindy Carpenter, I know you're here with bread and butter somewhere. Not literally, there she is, a really fantastic um, social entrepreneur uh, business, um, making bread, bread um, out of Marrick film, sour, fantastic sourdough. And they're all working to link um, employers to refugees, to help people get that sometimes all elusive foot in the door and tap into the talent, expertise and experience of these amazing people. The private sector also has a role in changing the narrative and sometimes negative perceptions about refugees. Again, many in this room are already doing that by sharing stories, uh, hosting speakers and engaging your staff in discussion around the issue of global displacement helping better understand on what drives people to go on the run and leave all that is dear to them. And if you really believe in diversity and inclusiveness in the workplace, then engaging with refugees is a very important part of that. For Australia for UNHCR, one of our key objectives is having a refugee voice at the forefront of the organisation, and we do that practically through representation on our board, through events like this, and also through our workforce. We have our own internship where we provide paid employment to refugees. I also wanted to call out our face-to-face -face team and program, through which we've employed hundreds of refugees since we started the program back in 2004, often as the first paid job they had in Australia. Just to remind you, our face-to-face -face teams are those people in the street or shopping centres wearing our UN blue vests, signing up regular donors to support UNHCR. For many donors, that's also their first point of contact with UNHCR, and it might be their first conversation ever with a refugee. Of course, COVID has impacted on the size of the program, and we also have successfully grown our many other channels of support. But we continue through the face-to-face -face program to engage in positive conversations around refugees every day with hundreds of Australians. Today we have our face-to-face -face team with us again, or part of it, and our campaign leaders, Safi Omed, Kofi Kumi and Isra Khan. Where are you guys? My, where's, there, I can see waving. Thank you. Um, Safi, who resettled in Australia from Afghanistan some years ago, but like a number of people in this room, has spent a very fraught and anxious time worrying about family and friends who have remained in Kabul. And Isra Khan, also a refugee who arrived as an asylum seeker from Pakistan, a qualified lawyer. Isra this week celebrates his 10 years anniversary working to support UNHCR as part of our Australia for you and ACR face-to-face team. I don't think there's any greater testament to the work of UNHCR than to have refugees themselves stand up and support our work. 
Finally, I wanted to talk about the power we all have to make change. One of my very first missions for UNHCR was to Afghanistan, six months after the Taliban had been defeated. I was visiting a bombed out building that had previously been a shoe factory, now home to hundreds of families. They had very little, thin rugs on the bare floor, uh, a kettle hanging off the wall, a family portrait taken in better times pinned on the door frame. Even with so little, every family invited me to sit with them and share a cup of green tea. Their hospitality, the one remaining possession that could not be taken from them, and they gave it to me. That experience has been repeated many times over. As I've said, sorry, it's, I get quite emotional, and I will be. As I sit with refugee families, mothers, children and share, have shared laughter and stories that I have in turn come back and shared with you, our donors. I've also had the privilege to share the best of humanity through the generosity of our donors. My job over 20 years has been to mobilise that generosity in support of refugees. We've achieved a lot with that generosity, raising nearly $400 million since we started in 2000. Thank you. <laughs> It's actually, it's actually 394, but if somebody wants to make a really big donation now, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> but of course, it's not the dollars that's important, it's what those dollars have achieved. Life-saving emergency assistance in every emergency that UNHCR has operated in the last 20 years. Cash assistance to vulnerable refugees in Jordan and Lebanon. Water and sanitation programs across East Africa. And I know I've got the Jaramas uh, um, Foundation here today. Um, hello, Robin. And they funded one of our first WASH programs, which had me going to Kakuma Refugee Camp, photographing for them hundreds of latrines, which I never wanted to go in and see again, but they, so I could bring back the report that they had been built and were being kept care of. Funding the first of many innovative programs, our safe mother and baby maternal health programs in Myanmar, Somalia and DRC. Our computer centre in Nakavali, the first ever built in a deep field location, providing new skills and through the internet, connecting refugees for the first time to their families and putting them on an equal footing with everybody on the internet. As one refugee said to me, using the internet, it makes me feel more than a refugee. Building schools for refugee children and funding education programs and providing funding for employment and livelihood programs such as our Refugee Women's Network in Kampala, Uganda. Oh, and I think various tables, there's key rings. Um, Peter, could you hold it up? Thank you. And if you don't have one, please ask one of supporters. Through this simple little key ring that we fund and we give to donors, we we've actually support a community of 500 of women and, and children in Kampala. So it's often the small things, but as you would all know, and many of you from business, it's the scale that, that's important. Just think of how many lives all these things have changed for the better because of this work. Because uh, before I finish, I wanted to thank all of you um, today, many of whom who have supported me personally, and Australia for UNHCR from our humble days. I have a truly amazing board of passionate and, and committed leaders, Michael Dwyer, Kate Dundas, Lynn Dang, Peter Shergold, Rick Millen and John Boltby. Um, I've mentioned just some of our representatives, but of course we have the fantastic Ian Chappell who has been with us from day one. Thank you, Ian. To my a for u team, Deputy Trudy Mitchell and long-standing colleague and Strategic uh, Development Director, Deborah O'Neill, and all the current and past staff who've contributed to our success over many years, thank you. Thank you to my colleagues, uh, Nigel Lamb and Adrian Edwards. It's no secret, it's not always smooth sailing in a sort of partnership with you and HCR, a bit of a de David and Goliath. But how lucky I have been the last couple of years to have such wonderful colleagues in Nigit and, and Adrian, who really have worked um, to maximise what we both do best in supporting refugees. Thank you so much. 
And finally, my family. Thanks and love to my sister Louise, who's up there with the Monte San one of the many Monte San Angelo tables here today. I, when I was reading about the teal um, teal campaign, you know, and I think it was Skeggs or uh, which was the school everybody got behind for um, Allegra to to win. Well, I've got Monty today, and thank you. And Louise has been a huge support, uh, providing pro bono legal advice for many years. My mother, Valerie, who can't be here today, uh, but volunteered with Australia for U UNHCR from age 79 to 86, and who tells me I'm far too young to retire. So as your mother is always right, I'm not. And to my husband, Peter, my son, Avery, and daughter, Alicia, who have attended every World Refugee Day breakfast and our lunch, together with Chris, Alicia's partner, you have supported me in everything I have tried to do. Even though as a working and often travelling mum, it meant missing birthdays and school events sometimes. Though for the record, I never missed one of your swimming carnivals, Alicia, as a timekeeper, and Avery, I attended every beatbox performance. <laughs> For me, it's appropriate to finish with my family, and Australia for UNHCR has been very much part of my family and my life for 22 years. I know for many of you the same. It's been an absolute privilege to be on this journey with you all, and I look forward to both my next chapter and also for that of Australia for UNHCR, as it continues under Trudy's leadership to mobilise Australians in support of what is indeed the greatest humanitarian cause of our time. Thank you. Naomi, thank you so much. I'm sure we've kind of a few teary eyes in the house. My heart actually feels sore, Trudy. It'd be wonderful to have you in Naomi's role. And um, yeah, Naomi, thank you for everything you've done for me as well. It's been an absolute honour to work alongside you. I feel quite emotional. Um, so I'm going to turn now to the Les Murray Award for Refugee Recognition. This award is in honour of the late Les Murray, so many of you will have known him. Um, he was a former refugee from Hungary who became known as SBS's Mr Football. This award celebrates the achievements of former refugees in fields like the arts, sports, media and advocacy. As Naomi mentioned, there's this beautiful booklet on your table. Um, I just had a coffee earlier and read through all the stories. They're so wonderful. And these are the stories of um, the eight people who were nominated for this award. They're really remarkable stories, so I hope that you can have time to read those. Now, five of the nominees are actually in this room with us today. Daniel Malmbasa, Riza Rostami, Hangama, Obadala, Yasmin Ahmed, and Yoshen Joyan. Now, before I introduce you to the winner of this year's Les Mairi Award, let's have a look at this short film that tells the story of some of the nominees. Hello, I'm Les Murray, and if you're one of the 25 million people around the world playing soccer, or one of the billions watching it, this is your station. One of the reasons the football community loved Les was because he championed showing World Cups. Football was the one that showed all of the cultures around the world and brought them to an Australian audience. I'm a refugee. In 1956, as a small boy, my family and I crossed the border from Hungary into Austria. We wanted to honour Les Murray uh, because he was such a great advocate uh, for refugees and displaced people. That was a real focus for him, to break down barriers and bring people together. My name is Ahmed. I came from Iran to Australia in 2012. Uh, the reason I left my country because my life became in danger. So when I get to Australia, it was for me like like a newborn baby. You have to learn everything from start again. 
But I was lucky I had uh, my talent at like cooking and I started sharing my recipes from my country to people. I started cooking classes and then started my catering business and started this social enterprise. And this one is the slow cook lamb it uh, with tomato and egg. They feel like they are part of community after a while. They get the ch get to chance to talk to people. <laughs> and as a human, I feel like what I received the support before, I can now give it back to the community in this way. Yeah, my name is Yasmin Ahmad. I came from Burma the country known as Myanmar right now, I came to Australia around 2003. Yeah, my parents uh, uh, flee uh, Burma because of the situation at that time. Uh, they have been deprived from a right to be citizen. So just for the future of their children, uh, us, my parents, uh, left Burma. When we first arrived here, we, are, we were really happy because finally we came to a country where we don't need to go anywhere. Uh, no more looking for a different country uh, to settle in. Um, we were happy, but at the same time, we realized that actually we have to learn the language, the culture again. <laughs> One of the biggest uh, reason or motivation behind that is to create a voice, the voice for Rohingya community in Australia. I want to be their voice. At the same time, to keep our language alive and then to create awareness among Australians that there is a community called Rohingya who exists in Australia. Um, my name is Mariam and uh, I came to Australia at the age of 20, 22 years ago. I don't think that anybody will want to leave their country of where they've been born and they've been raised. I was 15 when I was literally forced to leave Afghanistan due to the war. Uh, when I came to Australia, I came without no uh, prior um, uh, um, work experience or language, um, education, nothing. I just came uh, literally with just a, uh, a pair of clothes that I had on and that's it. But I did come with, with eagerness, passion, love and commitment that when I have something I'll give back, which I'm now using my voice. Most of refugee and migrant women that come to Australia from war-torn countries, they suffer from a lot of trauma and that, that trauma stays with you forever if you don't seek help or if you don't have the voice and talk about it. We have one thing in common, uh, to come together and share our stories. So uh, at times we laugh but also we cry. The bottom line for our movement is to connect our women and be part of a bigger picture in Australian society. The winner of the inaugural Les Murray Award for Refugee Recognition is Daniel Mabasa. Daniel came to Australia as a refugee from the former Yugoslavia. He's an industrial relations lawyer and in his spare time he advocates for refugees. He sits on the steering committee of the National Refugee-Led Advisory and Advocacy Group. He volunteers as a migration agent with Refugee Legal. Here he helps asylum seekers apply for temporary protection visas. He's also the deputy chair of the Forcibly Displaced People Network. This is Australia's first LGBTIQ plus refugee network. Please welcome Daniel to the stage.
This is a fun part where I get to have a chat with Daniel for 10 minutes or so. So lovely to see you, Daniel. Um, your, early your early years were spent in Croatia, then life changed very dramatically for you when the Croatian War of Independence broke out in 1993. Tell us what happened. Yes, I mean, I was a refugee twice and I've survived three wars. So when we talk about Yugoslavia, it's not just one war, it's the Croatian War of Independence, it's the Bosnian War, it's the Kosovo War. So yeah, I was a refugee um, twice. Um, I mean, I had a very idyllic childhood before 1993. Um, that's when the Civil War began. So after that, I mean, I don't want to be Debbie the Downer <laughs> here, but it was a bit difficult, um, <laughs> a bit difficult, uh, you know, to sort of experience uh, a life as a child um, in war uh, from the age of about six until about about five and a half until 12 and a half, I was pretty much living in a refugee camp on the outskirts of Kosovo in a sort of a, uh, it was kind of like a factory as big as this and they just put mattresses on the floor and that's how we lived side by side. Um, and you know, when we talk about refugees, we just really have this paradigmatic view that it's just, you know, uh, maybe mum and dad and a couple of kids from Syria, but it's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, I'm a product of a mixed marriage, ethnically mixed marriage, and that matters, especially in a civil war, it matters. Um, and, you know, my mom was somebody who is a real inspiration to me because she was uh, a woman refugee who's also a widow, who's also a Croat in Serbia, which was a bit difficult at the time. And she was also, you know, a factory worker. And so I had to work with her as a child labourer during our life in Kosovo. So I just to sort of, in my advocacy, want people to understand that it's a lot more deeper than just the word refugee, who we are. You mm. lost your dad when you were seven years old after he stepped on a landmine. Mm -hmm. How did your family cope with the loss of your father? Yeah, so I mean, look, it was, it was really difficult. Um, as I said, because of a patriarchal Balkan culture, I mean, uh, my mom was really the breadwinner in, in that sort of environment. She was often the only woman in her line of work. And uh, when you are in flight, you know, you really just have yourself to rely on. Um, and so she was really somebody that managed to find shelter, find, you know, housing to keep us warm constantly. Uh, constantly um, sort of worrying about us um, and that's uh, I think an extraordinary thing that she did as uh, you know a war widow by herself. Mm. You've written a lot about your experience and you want to read a little bit of that mm. today for us. Would you mind sharing that with us? Sure. Uh, so I wrote this bit, um, I was inspired by the contributions that refugees make to this country and I did not like the way that we um, you know, that we sort of uh, typecast refugees as not contributing to our country as being a burden. You know, I'm not a burden, I'm a resource. Uh, I'm not a um, crisis to manage, I'm an asset for this country, as are every other refugee. So I was sort of inspired to write about that, and I'll just read it, it goes for about 60 seconds. Um, but yeah, if anybody wants to buy this book, it's called Seeking Asylum, and all the proceeds go to Advocacy and Power Program of the Asylum Seeker Resource Center that empowers people with a lived experience. Um, Thank you, Daniel. Okay. It is 2016. I am sitting in a cafe outside the Fair Work Commission in Melbourne, Australia. I am now a lawyer. I have gone from milking cows in a war zone to representing blue-collar workers in Australian courts. I speak English fluently with pomaded hair neatly parted, a good quality moisturiser and a tailored suit. No one can tell I was once a stateless refugee covered in cow dung, stuck in back-to-back -back wars. I had just finished representing an Australian worker who was unfairly dismissed from his job, We're grabbing a coffee after the hearing. As we talk, he begins complaining about refugees. He says that he heard the Minister for Immigration say on the radio that they are coming to take jobs from Australians, that they will be a burden on the welfare system, that they are illiterate and innumerate, that they do not assimilate. I feel an almost visceral urge to confront this man to tell him about the realities of war, to explain to him that he is speaking to one of them, that I am not a faceless threat, but a human being with a name made up of bone and blood, that I am not anonymous exile trying to steal his job, that in fact I, a refugee, just got him his job back. I want him to realise that there are no neat categories of people, orderly cues, easy answers or simple facts. 
there is only us sharing common humanity and a common destiny. I want him to see through the racist framing the minister wants him to swallow. This agenda deceives low-paid, award-dependent, white, working-class people like him by stoking animus against people like me. But instead, I choose silence. The words of the Holocaust survivor, Elie Wiesel, sting in my ears. To forget would be not only dangerous but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin, akin to killing them a second time. I think of those who died in war and feel guilty for not speaking up, but it does not feel like a safe space for sharing. Thank you, Daniel. There's something I wanted to tap your brains about. Um, in May this year, in relation to the war in Ukraine, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, said this. He said, saying that the people fleeing Ukraine are real refugees and those who do so from other parts of the world are not is shameful and racist. All of those who flee war, persecution and discrimination have the right to seek asylum. Can you share some thoughts around that? Yeah, so I think, you know, I really don't want to be sort of cynical about this situation, but I do think it's imperative for us to look at the way Ukrainian refugees are treated as compared to uh, people from Afghanistan and Syria and, and those sort of parts of the world. Um, I think, you know, the fact that we took about 6,000 Syrians overnight and yet we have not done that that well for Afghans, it took a long time, I think it speaks to the fact that it's never really about political capacity, but about political will. Um, and so we can really, I think, use this moment to reframe the issue and, and try and provide um, assistance to everybody, regardless of their uh, skin color. I mean, in, uh, I've read somewhere a statistic that when I was a Yugoslav refugee, I received something like eight times more help than the people in Rwanda and Sierra Leone um, because I'm blonde, blue-eyed, white, white European. So I think, you know, hopefully there's no elements of racism in it, but it sort of is really, I think, something that we need to think about. Why is it that we erected fences and barbed wire fences and sprayed kids with pepper sprays and beaded them with batons, uh, people from Middle East, and yet welcomed people from Ukraine? I mean, I do think that it, there's, there is an easily, easily identifiable bad guy and a good guy, you know, in Putin, and people can sort of relate to that, um, whereas I think other conflicts in Middle East and Africa are a lot more complicated about you know, what is sort of uh, going on there, so people can kind of identify with Ukrainians, but it, it really is, at the end of the day, we're talking about human beings here, so I think we, we can use this opportunity to try and really, you know, get, get to understand who is a refugee and that anybody can be a refugee, really. It just takes one war, uh, one pandemic, one nuclear disaster, um, and, and you can find yourself in my shoes. Daniel, before you go, thank you so much for having this chat. I know that in the past you've said you sort of didn't want to necessarily be a voice for refugees and now you're absolutely an advocate for those people who often don't have a voice. What made you change your mind? Yeah, so, I mean, look, I think that there is a difference between a, a refugee and an, and an immigrant. You know, a lot, of, a lot of refugees, especially from Yugoslavia, they call themselves migrants because they don't like to be associated with something that's such a depravity. But I think um, that, we, you know, I'm proud to be a refugee. I'm proud to be somebody who is a survivor, somebody who is determined, resilient, resourceful. When we talk about refugees, you know, it takes, it, it takes courage to survive. It's, it's a creative act to survive, to find those, to find safety. And I'm really proud of that identity. Um, and so I, I think, you know, as I said, we really need to appreciate the fact that anybody can be in this situation. It's not a choice you make. You look, with the Ukrainian situation, you can be in your safe democratic country one night, the next minute there's five of you across the border, and the welcome is going to wear out very soon in some of these countries. So we really need to think about that and think about supporting you know, UNHCR because they were there for me and they'll be there for Ukrainians. Daniel, thank you so much. Congratulations on being the inaugural winner of the Les Money Murray Award for Refugee Recognition. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.
So let's have a quick look at where we are at with those fundraising targets. Um, I hope the QR code things are working on your phones really well. Um, if you've got any problems, just um, let uh, Naomi's husband know. He'll help you with that. Um, let's just have a look at where we're at. We'll try and get those figures up on the screen in a sec. Um, you can also obviously buy raffle tickets um, through that QR code as well. I might just have some tech issues down the back. I might have to start doing some singing or something. Here we go. Oh, wow. So you can see those blue dots. Those are the $500 or more donations. Thank you so much to everyone who's donated. Um, we have now raised, let's have a look at the totals so far. Um, let's see where we're at. I love this real-time donation. OK, we're creeping up, 192,000. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. We would really, um, really love to get to that target of 250,000. We're going to have a lunch break very shortly, so that's a really great time to jump on those phones, buy those 10 raffle tickets, um, pop some money. You can also do two transactions at the same time. So if you want to sort of donate $20 um, to the fund and then buy raffle tickets, you can do that at the same time. Our volunteers can come round and help you with that. Please welcome back to the stage Kumi Taguchi. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, this is the tough part of my day where I try and bring everyone back to here. Um, I know you guys are loving your conversations and the lunch is amazing. I've seen a lot of you swapping dishes. Um, we're going to keep the afternoon moving. Thank you so much for so quickly quietening down and I hope you can still feel like you can enjoy your food. We do want to keep things sort of running to time but we did start a bit late and um, we might end up finishing just a little bit late just to let you know. Um, thank you so much for the first half of our program. I just want to check in on where we are at with um, fundraising. Firstly I'd like to say a huge shout out to EG Funds Management who have pledged donated $10,000 here today. Thank you so much. Um, it has been a busy lunch break with your QR codes. Let's just check in on those numbers. There they are. Those are blue dots, those $500 donations. Thank you so much. There's still plenty of time to donate before we finish today. And we've got those 20 fantastic raffle prizes if you want to jump on and buy some raffle tickets. Um, shall we have a look at the target? Where are we at now in terms of our 250,000? Oh, wow, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. There's not that much to go. So as we mentioned, if you do want to do that $5,000 or $10,000 pledge, um, have a touch to Trudy and the team to do that. Thank you so much. Now, our next speaker um, will be very familiar to you. I, I would gather that so many people in this room have read his book. Dr. Munjan al Madiris is a former Iraqi refugee. He escaped Saddam Hussein's Iraq. After a dangerous journey by boat to Australia and so many other challenges, he eventually became an author orthopaedic surgeon. His day-to-day -day work involves hip and knee surgery. Professor Almadiris is also a leading surgeon in a revolutionary technique, technology rather, known as osteointegration. This basically helps amputees improve their mobility and reduce their pain. In 2020, he was named the New South Wales Australian of the Year for his humanitarian work and for his contribution to medicine. Please welcome to the stage Munjed Almadiris. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, everybody. Can you show me what's the target place and where we are? Excellent. And we are 218. Please donate, because if you're not going to finish this, I'll match the number <laughs> by the end of the day. That's my pledge. So save me some money, please. Okay, um, my name is Munjit. Thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here, and I do apologize for being politically incorrect. I would like to start by thanking all Australians and acknowledging all Australians, starting by the first Australians of this land, going through the first settlers, the descendant of the convicts, and the late migrants, and the refugees. Um, all Australians here work together to make this country successful and provide good futures 
for our children, and we should work very hard on keeping that. I also would like to thank Philip Product and Tony Abbott and Peter Dutton for not deporting me so far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 27 represent a number for me, but it's a very important number. It's the dividing time of my life. I'm becoming 50 in a week, and I have a different experience in the first 27 years of my life to the second 27 years of my life. The first 27 years of my life was in Iraq. I was born in Baghdad. Baghdad was a cosmopolitan city, pretty much like Sydney. We had fireworks, similar to Sydney fireworks, but there were real planes being shot by real missiles. But it was stable. I felt safe. The irony is that it was home. I was living among family, friends, and I was comfortable. And then things changed. I had to leave in a blink of an eye because Saddam decided to mutilate army deserters' ears, and I was unfortunately a doctor working in Baghdad University. Thank you for jumping that. I forgot all about the slides. Um, and we were ordered to abandon our elective list and start mutilating these army deserters by chopping their ears off. The head of the department refused, and um, they took him out to the car park that Saddam's thugs, and uh, they put a bullet in his head, and they turned to the rest of us, and they said, now you uh, attracted your attention. Anyone share this man's view? Come forward, otherwise proceed with our orders. I had to face the most complex and difficult decision in my life. Should I obey the commands and live with guilt for the rest of my life? Should I refuse and end up with a bullet in my head? Or should I run away? And from that moment onward, I became a refugee. I came to Australia as a refugee on a boat. I am a refugee, and I will forever be a refugee. And let me tell you, a lot of people tell me that every day to this date. And with your help, we need to change that. Because Australia is better than that. And we can help each other to be better human beings. The journey started on a boat to Christmas Island. In Christmas Island, we were received very well by the federal police. They were brilliant. Okay? They put us in basketball stadiums. They um, gave us Salvation Army clothes because it was very wet. And uh, I learned very important lessons in Christmas Island, um, the most important lesson in my life. On the third day on the island, I was asked by the federal police to accompany them to intercept another boat as an interpreter. And um, we went on two barges. On one barge was a captain and his deputy, and another barge was another officer, a person who saw me for the first time and the last time. But he looked at me as a human being. And he asked me the question of, when was the last time you spoke to your family? And I said to him, when I left Jakarta. And he picked up his phone, he picked up a satellite phone from his pocket, and he said, sit on the ground, don't you dare tell anyone. Mind you, I tell everybody now. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm breaking the law, and I'm putting my job on the line. And he gave me the phone and said, call your family, tell them that you're safe. Forever, I will be grateful for this man that I managed to contact my mother and tell her that I'm safe. and. To his credit, um, she continued to live till the day I was released from the detention center. I spent 10 months in Curtin Detention Center, and um, from the moment we entered Curtin Detention Center, my life changed. The first thing happened to us was we were marked with permanent marker on our shoulders with number 982. I was given that number as a new name. We were held behind barbed wires. In compounds, we were head counted four times a day. You have to line up for three, four hours um, to be head counted. We were treated like animals. Um, a lot of people suffer from a lot of post traumatic disorder as a result of that. Um, no matter what I describe to you about the detention center in Australia, I can't give it its justice. But I can tell you 
um, a simple comparison. Because of me being outspoken, I was very quickly singled out as a troublemaker. So I had the pleasure of serving in Her Majesty's, uh, I don't know what you call it, um, service apartments, jails, prisons, um, for many, many weeks. So I spent some time in um, Karatha jail. I spent some time in um, um, Broome Maximum Security Prison. And I'll tell you what. The prison system in Western Australia was absolutely fabulous. I recommend it to everybody. <laughs> you don't need to worry about the prison system here. I was treated like a human being. I was treated with dignity. I had change of clothes. I had proper meals. And I was called by my name, which is something that I never noticed since the moment I entered Australia to the moment I left the detention center. Um, and I had access to a telephone in the prison system. So I caused more damage to the Department of Immigration. And when the Department of Immigration realized that I'm causing all this damage, they put me back in the detention center. This time, in a rehabilitation facility called the Suicide Watch Dog. Uh, sorry, it's not a dog. <laughs> Suicide Watch Donga. Um, and it was like a, a box. Uh, two and a half meter by one and a half meter, a mattress on the floor. Um, there was no um, sheets, no pillow, so I don't hang or suffocate myself. And uh, there was a small hole in the door uh, that I could see the light, um, no windows. And uh, I was staying there for 22 hours. And every time I asked the question, what am I doing here? They say, we are rehabilitating you because you spent time in jail. So you need some rehabilitation. So it was a deliberate kind of act of punishment because I spoke out. And um, I still speak out, and I still get attacked. Um, and when I was found to be a legitimate refugee, the manager in the detention center, his name is Craig Wallace. I would love to meet him one day. Um, he was uh, Philip Roddock's best man. And um, he basically had a lot of embarrassment because of me. So when the group of the detainees were supposed to be flown to Brisbane, I was let go outside Curtin. Um, to catch a bus. And uh, if you know where Curtin is, it's between Derby and Broome. And, uh, um, and when I asked the question, what am I doing? Um, and they said, well, there is a Greyhound bus that can take you from uh, Curtin to Broome, and then you, you can fly from there. And I saw that this is a great opportunity that this guy is giving me uh, to travel around Australia by bus. So I took the bus from Broome to Perth to Adelaide to Melbourne to Sydney. And thanks to him that he gave me this opportunity. The point is that we need to learn from our experiences and we don't need to hold grudges and take things like in a negative way. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, my journey in Australia has been like a wheel of fortune. I'm doing very well at the moment um, and um, I live a very comfortable life. I'm a professor in three universities. I just finished my doctorate of uh, medical science from Notre Dame, and my graduation is next month. So it's great. My position on the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> my position on the Wheel of Fortune is on top, but I'm prepared to go back to the detention. And you never know. It's the bad, this, this feeling that many of you do not feel. And I'm very glad and very pleased to see that my kids don't have this feeling, is the sense of insecurity, the sense of unsettlement, the sense of feeling that in any minute you may be deported, in any minute you may lose your position, in any minute you may lose everything. Uh, and it's not nice. I'll tell you an example. Claudia, my partner, who I thank very much for keeping me strong, um, we were in, in New York one day, and I was sitting in, at dinner with a good friend, um, a gentleman by the name of Robert Rosbrook. He's a leading surgeon in Hospital of Special Surgery in, uh, in New York. And he come from a refugee family. His family survived um, the Nazis uh, and the Holocaust. And I asked Robert one day, Robert, how much money do you have under your tiles? And he said, fair bit, why, why are you asking that? And I said, well, 
can you explain to Claudia why? And he looked at her and he said, because I never know when the day will come that I will be kicked out of America. Because that's what happened to his family. And when, when it happens to your family, it, it stays with you. And unfortunately, he was born in America. He's fully born American Jewish citizen uh, living in New York, very comfortable. And one in four people in America are Jews. And, uh, but he has this feeling that um, he's not safe. So this is the feeling that people like me have. And this is what people don't understand. And it's ridiculous when we see politicians, unfortunately, talk about these refugees coming to this country, trying to live in the social security, and at the same time trying to take our jobs. And at the same time, they are coming to rip us off our money. People don't want to leave. I share with Miriam's her opinion. People don't want to leave their country, regardless of how bad is the situation, if they don't have to. Because that's your comfortable place. That's the place that you're born in. And that's the place that you will live your life, regardless of the surrounding. And as long as there is stability and there is um, um, you know, a stable, flat, um, stance situation rather than a turbulence and, and, and change. I lived on the center link for two months in Australia. I was released from detention center on the 27th of, um, uh, 26th of August 2000. And um, I received my first paycheck as a doctor on the 1st of November 2000. So I worked my, heart, um, uh, worked my ass off, basically. Uh, worked very hard um, to serve this country. And from the minute I was released, I worked with any job. I worked as a toilet cleaner to, to start with, and I didn't mind it. It's a job like any other job, because that's how I was, I was brought up. And then I realized that I may be more functional as a doctor, because that's what I know, and um, I didn't do a very good job as a toilet cleaner. But um, <coughs> I, I didn't know the system. I wasn't familiar with how things are done. So I went and knocked on every single hospital door, asking them to employ me. And I kept getting rejections. Um, the first door I knocked on was um, in Perth, in Royal Perth Hospital. And funny enough, I asked the receptionist to call the on-call doctor. And it turned out to be an Iraqi doctor. Um, his name is Karim, actually. Um, he denied that I said, uh, he said what he said to me, but anyway. Um, um, I shook his hand and I said, can you hire me? I'm a doctor. And he said, when did you get out of detention? And I said, two days ago. And, I, and he said, well, this is, doesn't, doesn't work like that in, in Australia. You need to go to the farms, collect some fruits, and, um, and then um, earn some money, and then study English, pass your exam in English, and then sit the AMC exam. And then if you get uh, recognized uh, as a doctor, then you can work as a doctor. And he said, by the way, what do you want to specialize in? And I said, I want to do robotic surgery. And he laughed. And he said, this doesn't work that way. It's only for Anglo-Saxons. And you, need to, you, you haven't gone to the right school. You, you, don't, wear the, you don't play the, the, the right rugby um, um, you know, um, uh, uh, or cricket or whatever, that thing, that thing. And um, <laughs> So I thought this guy is racist. <laughs> anyway, I did the same thing again and again and again a few times. And then I remembered some wise man uh, one day said that um, um, the ultimate insanity is doing the same thing again and expecting different results. So um, I found this place called the Centerlink. And um, I went to the Centerlink and I said to them, I want to work as a doctor. And they said, well, you need to fill a CV. And I said, what's that? And then they taught me how to fill a CV. And then I sent my CV to different hospitals. And very quickly, I got two job interviews and two job offers, one, one from Mildura and one from Shipperton. Bottom line, I learned how to do how to work through the system. Funny enough, back then in the days, I don't know how it is now for refugees, nobody told me what to do. I was released from the detention center to catch a bus. And I think we can do better uh, than that, because it's a, it's a lot of waste of 
taxpayers' money. Um, once I worked, I started climbing the ladder very, very quickly and um, very dangerously, basically. And a lot of people think that I'm dangerously fast. Um, and everything became very rosy. And then I worked in Wollongong Hospital. And that was the first kind of city hospital in the country. It was fantastic. In Mildura, everybody loved me um, because who would want to live in Mildura? And, uh, um, funny enough, it's a beautiful place, <laughs> okay? Um, the emergency department was run by six Iraqi doctors and one Turkish doctor, and um, the community are extremely lovely and very friendly, and I thought, this is heaven. Australia is heaven. Then I went to Wollongong, and I was sitting in the, in the tea room, and I saw this lady who um, looked at me, and she said, where are you from? And I said, mm, okay. <laughs> I said, well, I'm from Iraq originally. And she said, you guys come here and take our money and take our jobs, and we're going to be out of job. And that was the first time I noticed that there is this kind of friction and this kind of misinformation. Um, and she was one of the nurses, actually. And I said to her, look, I'm sorry, but you know, I had to come here. I didn't choose to come to Australia. I didn't know that I was coming to Australia until the minute I got to the boat. Um, so, and then I moved on. And, um, and I was very timid and scared about disclosing where I come from, so people don't look at me differently. Funny enough, if I look at the mirror, I look different, don't look right. Um, and no matter what I do, okay, I just wanted to move on with my life and turn my back to the past and just start a family and start new life in this new country. And. Um, and I managed to navigate my way, and I was concentrating and doing my education and, and studying very hard, trying to achieve um, my dream of, can you move to the next uh, picture? Um, next dream to, um, uh, to establish this technology called OSI integration, where you hook up um, robotic um, to amputees, because I lived in Iraq where I saw a lot of people who are disabled, and, um, um, and I wanted to help them. So I had this dream of doing this kind of technology. Um, and um, until the moment where I was on the top of the wheel of fortune, uh, where in my welcome uh, dinner at the acceptance to the Australian Orthopedic Training Scheme, which is one of the most prestigious schemes in, uh, in training in Australian medicine. Um, I was faced with two of my peer. To my face, they said it that, isn't it a shame that the Australian training scheme has dropped so low to allow a refugee to be one of us? And that was the turning point in my life where I thought, well, maybe I should not turn my back to the past, and maybe I should remember people like me, and, um, and maybe I should start fighting. So it was a very long journey, and I continue to fight. Um, I think we can do better in Australia. Um, I think we need to be very vigilant that Complacency is not good. It doesn't serve anyone. And, it, and it's a shame that human beings um, keep forgetting. If you look at it, generations past, and every 80 years or so, because that generation is gone, people repeat the same mistakes again. What happened in the 30s is happening now in Europe to a different scale. It's been happening all the way in the Middle East, unfortunately. And it may happen here. And we don't want that to, do, to happen. I think we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different colors. We all have different faiths. We all deserve to be proud of who we are. Unfortunately, there is this thing called patriotism, and there is this thing that called the sense of being a tribal. 
And you see that often. In soccer, you see it. In rugby, you see it in everything. But we should never cross that red line where it becomes a religion or it becomes a strong belief that we are better than others because we are not. There is nothing wrong for us to be proud, but there is all wrong with us thinking that we're better than others. And there is a lot of wrong with us trying to d dictate how others should live. If we all... <laughs> if we all treat each other the way we want to be treated, the world will be a better place. After all, if you cut our skin, believe me, I'm a surgeon, we all share the same color blood. It's red, but we don't realize that. So thank you very much for having me here, and I do apologize for inconveniencing you. Thank you so much, Professor. We were going to do a Q&A, but we're sure. going to have to move on for time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, ab absolutely not an inconvenience at all. Thank you so much, Professor Almadiris. I know we're running a little bit over time. Um, we've po probably got about 15 minutes left of the program, so thank you so much for sticking in a little longer. If you do have to leave um, and you have put in raffle tickets, you will get notified if you are one of those lucky winners. Um, it, speaking of raffle tickets, there's about 10 minutes left to buy any raffle tickets, and then we will do the draw um, just towards the end of um, the lunch. As I mentioned earlier, we are so grateful to our presenting sponsor, First Sentier Investors, for the support it's provided over so many years. It's this kind of generosity that make an event like today absolutely possible. It's my pleasure to welcome First Sentier CEO, Mark Steinberg, to have a quick chat with you. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today for World Refugee Day. Um, it's funny, um, a year ago we were talking about the pandemic, and uh, it seems that even though the, the, the worst of the pandemic is behind us, um, the world is still facing a lot of dislocation and distress, and a, a number of speakers today have referred to the, you know, the war in Ukraine, but it, it does remind us that... Um, you know, the threat of conflict is always a possibility. Um, the spike in food prices um, reminds us about how globally interconnected we still are. Um, and the mass evacuation of people all around the world to save a part uh, you know, in other countries um, underlines the fact that we always need to maintain uh, a welcome for our neighbours. Um, and while Ukraine is, is one of the more recent conflicts and uh, you know, is, is prominent in the news, um, we can't forget, um, as our other speakers have reminded us today, about the many millions of people around the world who are fleeing other wars, other conflicts, um, other situations of repression and hunger. Um, UNHCR continues to be a critical source of support for these people. And we're very, very grateful to the, their commitment uh, to this mission. World Refugee Day, I promise you I didn't break anything. <laughs> World Refugee Day is an occasion to build empathy, empathy and understanding for the, their plight and to recognize their resilience in rebuilding their lives. First CNT Investors has been a long standing supporter of this event, as Kumi reminded us earlier. And um, our vision, amongst other things, is to contribute to the societies in which we operate. Uh, now, whether that's working with investee companies on their approach to supply chains, for example, um, considering our own environmental footprint, uh, or supporting causes that we feel uh, align with our values. Uh, and, and this is very much uh, one of those causes. Um, 
While we can't control the broader forces of war or, or tyranny, we can contribute to the organisations who do provide a safety net. And UNHCR is one of these, and we're very proud to support the very important work that they do. So today, um, I thank you for the action you've taken to bring light to the darker places in the world. Uh, we can play our part, uh, no matter how big or how small. Um, now, one person who has played an enormous part in improving the lives of so many is the founding national director of UNHCR, Naomi Steer. Um, she mentioned earlier today marks her last World Refugee Day uh, and is your sponsor for today. Uh, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge, Naomi, your tireless work during the past 22 years to raise funds to support the humanitarian efforts of UNHCR. And so, uh, as I conclude, uh, I'd just like to leave you with a thought from Viktor Frankl, uh, a survivor of Nazi concentration camps. Um, Forces beyond your control can take away everything you possess except one thing, your freedom to choose how you will respond to the situation. Your attendance here today is an important acknowledgement of our freedom to seek change and, importantly, our obligation to do so. Thank you and all the best for the remainder of this year. Thank you so much. Now we have just one more speaker, um, then I'll announce the winners of the raffle and we'll also check in on our target of 250,000. It's now time to hear from the Chair of Australia for UNHCR, Michael Dwyer. Thank you, Kumi, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'd love to personally thank each of my friends and colleagues in the audience, but that would keep you here another couple of hours. Um, uh, but I do appreciate all of you and the support you, you've given both in monetary terms and just by your attendance here, not only today, but over the last 20 odd years I've been inviting you to these things, so thank you. It's terrific uh, that we've got such a great crowd here today, about 350, I think, and then we've got uh, probably, uh, if you add in uh, people online, it's up to about 420, so I think that's a tremendous response. I always look forward to this event, to catch up with old friends and colleagues and to meet some new and interesting people. Of course, we're here with a unity of purpose, and that's to raise money for refugees. And also today, especially in light of our, our guest speakers, um, uh, to acknowledge and celebrate the many achievements and contributions, but also a bit of a conscience-pricking exercise too, as to we can never be complacent. What a privilege it was to hear uh, Dr. Munjid al Madiris speak a short time ago. Thank you very much for, for reminding us of the important things in life. We invited Professor Al Madiris to be our keynote speaker a few years ago, but a little thing called COVID foiled that plan. I'm so grateful he could come and join with us today, um, and what an extraordinary and moving story. Um, and congratulations to Daniel Mabasa on winning the inaugural Les Murray Award for Refugee Recognition. Daniel is a most worthy recipient. I found his conversation equally disturbing and moving, and a great reminder. I'd like to thank guests. Thank you. You know, it made me, made me realise that we do have a comfortable life here in Australia, but we're not meant to be comfortable. If we're comfortable, I think that's a wrong sensation for us to experience on a, on a constant basis. We need to be disturbed about the things that aren't working properly and do something about it. Um, I'd like to thank SBS for its generosity in sponsoring this award over three years. It's such a wonderful way to honour the memory of Les Murray. Uh, it's been a tough 12 months for everybody. I know when I watch the TV news and see the pictures from Afghanistan and Ukraine, it's sometimes a bit overwhelming. Um, it's easy to be despondent and think, gosh, what can I as an individual do about all of these big problems? Well, the late great South African Bishop Desmond Tutu once said, do your little bit of good where you are because it's those little bits of good that overwhelm the world. I'll just take a few minutes to talk about somebody who has also done their little bit of good, and we've heard about it today, is our very own Naomi Steer. Uh, 
Uh, I think it was in the Star Wars movie where Obi Kibobi One said, "May the Force be with you." Well, that's what I always think of Naomi. The Force is certainly with us, you know. And you can tell I haven't watched that movie in a while. <laughs> Naomi made it very clear to me today, however, that she didn't want a big fuss made. Well, sorry, <laughs> that's failed. Um, because she wanted to focus on refugees today and the purpose that we all gather here and celebrating their achievements. It would be remiss of me as chair, however, not to take a few minutes to acknowledge Naomi as the founding national director um, and, of course, the big announcement that's, that's been made after 22 years. She recruited me about a year after she started, so it's been a wonderful journey between lifelong friends and colleagues. I first met Naomi in the late 90s, uh, when Naomi was on the board of Asset Super, and I was the CEO. Not long after Naomi started Australia Fuel and HCR in 2000, she asked me to join its board. Well, I was quite chuffed, because no one had asked me to join a board before. Um, I said, so what, what do we do? And she told me about the mission, and I said, look, I'm, I'm chuffed, but I'm puzzled. I, I said, I have no expertise in the area of refugees. In fact, I'm not sure I've met a refugee. Um, but she was very strategic. She said, no, but you know a lot of people in the super and the finance sector, and you can lean on them and they will put some money into the, into the hat as it goes around. And she was right. She was right. So not long after that, I joined the board, and I travelled with Naomi to East Timor. Um, and I suppose while I knew Naomi, it was the East Timor experience that really showed me the, the, the true substance of Naomi Steer. It was not long after uh, East Timor had voted for independence from Indonesia. Many of you will recall the violence that ensued with towns and villages that were decimated and vital infrastructure ruined. The birth of the world's newest nation was very traumatic and Australia stepped up to help by sending troops and large amounts of humanitarian aid. It was in East Timor that I really saw Naomi in action. She was adventurous. She was driven, she was focused, and she, above all, had a sense of humour. She was also brave enough to drive at night on some very dodgy roads. I, can, I was a very nervous passenger. <laughs> when she started Australia for UNHCR, it was literally her in a three-drawer filing cabinet. Over two decades, she's created an incredible organisation and been at the forefront of bringing to the, light of, the plight of refugees to the attention of all Australians. Well, refugees couldn't have asked for a better advocate than Naomi. She's travelled to all corners of the globe to see firsthand the challenges refugees are facing. She's stayed with refugees, she's laughed with refugees, she's cried with refugees. And importantly, she's come back home and told their stories and rallied her fellow citizens to give support. Australia for UNHCR is staffed by a team of deeply passionate and committed people. Last year, under Naomi's leadership, the team raised $43 million, including $11 million for the people of Afghanistan. And this year, on a year-to-day basis, we've raised even more for Ukraine. And when we add up the sums over 22 years, the numbers are phenomenal. Uh, since its inception in 2000, Australia for UNHCR has raised, um, well, I was going to say nearly 400 million, but, but thanks to EG and others, I think it could be you know, 500 million for all I know. Is that right, Michael Eason, 500? Um, Naomi's played a key role in establishing and chairing international groups too, the UNHCR National Partner Standing Group and UNHCR's Global Private Sector Partnership Council. She's helped UNHCR understand the increasing importance of the private sector as governments withdraw, and these funds are vital for refugees. It's been wonderful to see an outstanding, outstanding Australian so recognised on the international stage. Well, today for me is tinged with sadness because this is Naomi's last World Refugee Day as the National Director, but I'm very heartened by the fact that the Board has appointed Trudy Mitchell as the new CEO. And Trudy, thank you, yes. Why? <laughs> Trudy's worked very closely with Naomi, who chose her as her Deputy National Director about six years ago, and she'll begin that new role in early August. She's an experienced and well-respected leader and outstanding fundraiser, having won the Fundraiser of the Year Award last year. I'm confident the transition that's currently underway will continue to be seamless. I think in our Naomi Steer, you've got a very good example of can one person make a difference? By heck, they can make a difference and a big difference. Naomi, I'd like to you to come to the stage now. Um, and we have a bouquet of flowers for you, I think. He says that, he hopes that they have, you know. <laughs> To 
to my friend and colleague, we have some flowers for you, and on behalf of the Board of Directors and the staff of Australia for UNHCR, I'd like to thank you for your incredible advocacy, contribution, dedication and service, and we wish you all the best for the next chapter of life. And as her husband Peter said to me, Michael, can you imagine Naomi retired? I said, never, never. <laughs>
1091. Yay, Jenny. Um, Taronga Zoo Pass is number six. A family pass, two adults and two kids. I'm loving this. This is so good. Number seven is Bondi Wash Best Seller Box. Um, basically, these are lovely products, 99% plant-based ingredients. Um, okay, great. Number eight, Balance in Motion Pilates Package. You get an initial assessment and three classes. That's uh, 334. Number nine is um, here, this beautiful hotel. You get to stay overnight and executive suite stay for two, which is good, not just one, including breakfast. This is a great one. Ooh, ooh. Um, number 10, Angela Siddiqui. This is a beautiful Afghan Arizu doll, handcrafted, um, handcrafted by women who fled the Taliban regime. Number 11, if you like theatre, this one's for you. This is a double pass to um, A Raisin in the Sun at the Sydney Theatre Company. David. Um, this is the best one, in my view. Number 12, um, this is four tickets to the Members Arena of the SCG for the upcoming One Day International, Australia versus England, on Saturday the 19th of November. If you can't use the tickets, it's fine. That's number 12. 331. 13, paper bark. This is a two night stay for two in a deluxe safari tent. This would be awesome, including um, dinner and breakfast. So that's Karina. Woo! Um, 14, this is Big Banana, family big bunch of fun bundle for four. Is that the big banana in Queensland? I'm not sure what that one is. Double one, double two. Number 15, Nature's Energy Ultimate De-Stress Package, including a bathhouse, massage, signature massage, head and foot massage. Um, we've got five more to go. 16 is the Sydney Seafood School, a gift certificate for two. 468. Um, 17, Broken Wood Wines are four experience vouchers for tasting and a $30 online voucher. 107. Number 18 for sports fans, a Sydney Swans 2022 Guernsey signed by the team. This is great. 195. Woo. Kelly. Um, 19, Snow Goose, a large mixed fresh fruit gift box, including fresh fruit just picked 48 hours beforehand. And the final one is the Star, number 20. This is one night's accommodation at the Star Grand Sydney in a premium suite, and you also have a $250 dining credit at one of their beautiful restaurants there. Did that one come up? I think that came up. Um, that is it. I want to thank you so much for being here today. Oh, no, hang on. We need to quickly check on the fundraising target. That's me. Um, let's see where we're at. There's all our blue dot, 500 and above, 2,500. Thank you so much to our wonderful guest speaker. Let's have a look. 223, nearly 250. We're nearly there. There's obviously all those pledges if you want to pledge. But thank you so much to you all for contributing today. Congratulations. Thank you and have a wonderful weekend when you get there.